Gandhi, Julius Caesar, George Washington, Winston Churchill, Alexander the Great, Napoleon, JFK, Simon Bolivar, Henry VIII. We're not short on any examples of leaders who displayed qualities worth noting. Even the nefarious leaders possessed characteristics that made them worth following, or fearing, at least. But leaders through history are not just human leaders. Animals are great leaders too. As we mull over the question, what makes a great leader? It's important to acknowledge the animal kingdom and the various levels and styles of leadership within it. From elephants to lions to chimpanzees and wolves, animals have a lot to teach us human beings about being respected and respectful leaders. In all social spheres, there are leaders and there are followers. Some species have a desire for power. Some rely heavily on the women to lead. Others are very male dominated. In many species, the alpha position brings with it a lot of challenges, critics, and responsibilities. Sounds like us humans too. So join us as we explore the characteristics of leaders in many species and discover just who made them king or queen. All right, so Brian. Yeah. Who made you king? I think for all of us, the answer is simple. You make yourself king. Or queen. Or queen, right. All right. Or queen, yes. You make yourself king or queen. Um, I think it's. I think it is really up to you. You know, I. I. I don't think the idea of manifest destiny works anymore. So I think it's. It's in your hands. You know, there's something about a king or a queen or some sort of leader, right? And and I think you know we're going to talk about leadership today. Mm -hmm. So it's important to remember that this you know leadership can be on the smallest of levels, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely you can have leaders of small groups and you would have leaders of countries, right? Mm -hmm. Like leadership mm -hmm. is not, oftentimes we confuse leadership with management. And when you think about like the workspace, mm -hmm. I think we get confused. Like that person is managing a team, but that doesn't mean that they are a leader. Right. Like, you know, you may be a shift supervisor. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a leader. Well, you are in some ways, right? Because you're you're making sure everything goes correct. But, you know, I, I, I get where you're going with this, right? There, there are different levels of leadership. And you have two people, you know, depending on the situation, sometimes one leads and then sometimes the other one leads. So do you think that all role. great leaders, and I know there's tons of literature out there about this, do you think that all great leaders share some of the same qualities? I think there are some qualities that that they do share. I think there are also differences depending on the type of leadership it is. All right. So like, what are some of those differences? What do you mean? I think really one of the things where they're all similar is they sort of, most of them have a very clear vision on where they want to go, right? They have that trait where they're, they get very focused and they get other people to also believe in what where they're going right or what they they want to accomplish you know and sometimes that's a goal for everyone but they sort of take on that okay let's do this let's look at the future let's head in this direction so i think that's some of the similarities i think there are differences too because as we've seen some people there are leaders that are that dictate right and there are other people leaders that you know they work in a more um i'm saying like a more democratic fashion right you know where it's everyone's involved and let's all vote and let's all go down the path of, you know, what everyone believes is the best thing or whatever the case is, right? So there are very different tactics to becoming a great leader. And it really, honestly, I think it depends on the goal. It depends on the mission. And it depends on what you're actually doing to what type of leader actually becomes really, really important for a group. Well, and like you said, when you were talking about some of those differences about goals and vision, I mean, that's really what a leader is, isn't it? I mean, it's it's a person who has a clear vision, right? They want to motivate and inspire people to kind of achieve that vision with them. Right. And then they manage how they relay that vision. You rally yep. the people together toward that vision. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of times, and we know someone who is really good at selecting great, you know, employees, right? Yeah. I think part of that leadership role is knowing what to delegate, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. being able to pick the people who can go and execute the things yeah. that need to be achieved to, I'm sorry, yeah, achieved to get to that goal. Well, and, I, and then I think you point out, you point out a really strong trait in most leaders, right? Knowing where you're weak. 
Mm-hmm. You know, knowing where you're strong and knowing where you're weak becomes a very important part to leadership. Because if you're all ego and you think like you're the best in the world or whatever the case is, or, you know, however you want to put it, and you're not going, okay, there are things I just don't know, or there are things that other people are better at than I am. You know, it's hard to lead if you have that attitude, unless you are, you know, a, a monarch or something, right? <laughs> unless you mm-hmm. are the king or the queen, it's hard to just like put your fist down and, you know, go, yeah, this is what we, you you know, this is what I, I would demand you do. Like that doesn't work for most people, right? That does not work for most people. Okay, so let me raise this question then. And do you think that some people are just born leaders? I do. I think there are some people that have that, you know, we all hear natural born leader, right? You know, I think there's some people that have more of that personality. And I think there's pros and cons to that too. I think there's good and bad that, I mean, we see kids on the playground, right? Young kids interacting with each other. And sometimes someone's the one that's coming up with the idea to play the game or whatever. And then you also see those kids that think they could just, if they have a strong opinion or they yell and scream, they're going to get their way. And that makes them a leader, which that's like really bad leadership, right? Whereas the, you know, the kids who are trying to go, oh, hey, I have a great idea. Let's do this. Let's play this game. It'll be fun. And trying to convince, you know, that's more of real leadership. The other Mm -hmm. one's more of like, you know, a dictatorship, right? right. It's, You're a tyrant. It's very, You're a little right. tyrant. They're, they're becoming a little tyrant, right? And that becomes so. So I, I think they're. You know, do I do I do I know I'm not a scientist, right? I don't know if we're born that way or we're bred that way, but I do believe some people just have more of that that charismatic skill in order to attract other people, in order to you know their to help you know, help people see like, hey, yeah, let's go play whatever hopscotch first, jump rope or whatever the game is, you know. Mm-hmm. But I I do believe there are kids that you know that we are born with. Some of us are born with more of that natural born leadership, and I do believe. But doesn't mean that you can't be a leader if you don't have that. It's just you need to sometimes learn those skills or you need to learn your skills and understand yourself. And sometimes it's about confidence in yourself. So Mm -hmm. we see that with many people where some kids are just confident, like out of the gate, you know, right? Right. And where other kids, it takes them a while to sort of find themselves. It doesn't mean that they're going to be any less of a great leader. Mm -hmm. It just, they just need to come into their own, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with. And that's a great point because I think of, you know, a person who may have these great ideas and they have all of the things that a leader has, right? When we define leadership, they have a goal, they have a vision, like they Mm -hmm. have the will to do this, that maybe they're just um, not that confident in getting people to come and and join them. So, Mm -hmm. you know, does that make them, or maybe they're not great communicators where they can't kind of uh, relay the idea. Yeah. Right. But that doesn't mean that they don't have that inner leadership. Like they don't have yeah. that bigger vision. It's just, they don't know how to execute that. And that's exactly. where I think you can teach some skills. Well, I think that's where you could teach some skills and a smart person, like we talked about someone we work with hiring the right people who mm-hmm. can do those other things sometimes. Right. right? Or finding a friend who maybe you're, you know, you have these great ideas, but you're not really, you know, eloquent enough to mm-hmm. relay them, but you find a friend who, you know, we all know those salespeople, those people that could sell almost anything, right. <laughs> Who's very articulate as a way of, you know, um, smoothing other people or whatever the case is. Right. And, you know, you sort of go, okay, well, I need them as part of my team in order to, you know, sell my vision or whatever, however we're looking at it, right? I need them to help with that. So I, I think understanding your limits is a really strong point in, in leadership. But to play devil's advocate for a second, then you have a person who may have all that great leadership inside of them without that confidence or, or communication skills, but... You know, there's a there's a point where I think you reach where you can't teach um, like heart and you can't yeah, teach absolutely. desire. You can't absolutely. teach someone to have a vision yeah. of something else. You know, and so you look at someone like Thomas Jefferson, who actually was not the greatest speaker, but had this great vision, right, mm-hmm. for America, and he had the heart, mm-hmm. right. So you're mm-hmm. able to teach. Okay, I can teach or get around the right. the, the communication skills, right. but you can't teach mindset in in s or like a- absolutely. Heart. Absolutely. And I, I agree. I agree. Because without without heart or desire or will, mm-hmm. even if you have a great idea, look, how many people go, I have the greatest idea, and then they do nothing about it. Yeah. Nothing about it. We all know tons of people like that. They, you know, and it's like, so if you're not going to do anything, you're, you're only coming up with part of the solution, right? So mm-hmm. I agree with you. You know, I think heart is something you can't teach. And I, I also believe that's 
you know, it's it's a product too of who you are. You know, whether it's learned or it's it's how you are as a person. You know, I I believe it is it is a strong factor. But remember too, Thomas Jefferson was also surrounded by some pretty uh pretty sure. smart and uh, eloquent and right. powerful people right at his time. Exactly, and so, so he was able to kind of rely on those other people's skills or you know right. do a lot of things in writing because uh, you know we we spoke with one of the historians who who told us mm -hmm. a lot about his letters and that's how he was a great communicator would he have Absolutely. done well today on twitter i don't know but let you know maybe yeah. that was his, the, maybe maybe yeah. just tv interviews aren't his right name. right maybe he would have been like a social media guru right. right that's how he would have gained all his followers he would have been right. like you know that that you know thou that shalt not you know right I, yeah, I can see i mean imagine his tiktok he'd have you know 50 million people following him on tiktok i, I just can't even imagine like the the videos he would make but yeah let's let's go <laughs> we're talking about thomas jefferson and we're talking about humans right but you know one of the key things we're going to look at in the course of this episode is is the animal kingdom because i think yeah. before we get into humans right we really need to look at what leadership looks mm -hmm. like in the animal kingdom because i right. think there's a lot we can learn there absolutely i'd say it's as diverse as it is in the human world uh, you've got a whole lot of different species and different taxonomic groups who are designed by their social structures to run their kingdoms differently. Um, you often have a very male dominant, and that doesn't necessarily mean leadership, but male dominant society in most mammal species. Birds different, and then you go down to some of the lower orders, and I wouldn't even have an answer for you. Um, but going back to the mammals, the animal kingdom, that we're most familiar with. You have, um, in many cases, in social groups, because bearing in mind, you really don't need a leadership if you're a solitary animal. So if you're a snow leopard uh, living up in the, in the high terrain of Russia on your own, you don't need to be a leader because you haven't got any followers. You're a social cat. Um, but this is where lions in particular are so interesting um, because they break the rules of cat and do social uh, dynamics. And so there is a leadership structure with them um, as, as there is in many other social groups. So you have leadership styles where you have a single dominant character. You have leadership styles where you have a partnership. You have leadership styles where there's a coalition. Um, and you have ones that are sort of more based on um, a dominance model, which is these male ones that I mentioned. But when you go into the female um, leadership styles, there's much more variety, even though there's only about eight or nine species that have a matriarchy system. So you know how they say a good writer is a good reader? Like mm -hmm. you need that skill, that reading yeah. skill, it's like hone your writing skills. I think the same goes for leadership. And I know we're talking about the animal kingdom, but I think we can learn a lot about being a good listener from the animal kingdom, because like, how do you be a good leader without being, without listening to what the other people are saying and thinking? I mean, otherwise you're really just a tyrant, right? I mean, right. Well, uh, yeah. And I think it's sort of what we talked about earlier, right? If you're just always just projecting your idea and you're forcing other people into it you're, you it's that's not leadership right okay. it's it's wanting people to believe the same thing you want so you need to listen to them mm -hmm. and see what they what their goals are elephant leaders happen to be fantastic listeners too and there's really so much listening and cooperation going on among this particular species that there really isn't even pushback, which is crazy. You know, once a decision's made, I mean, Penny tells us that it's like fair and it's understood. Nobody's going to push back. Um, but once it's her decision, it's it's it, it's final and it's done. So there's a lot of sort of cooperation, communication, shared involvement. Um, but she is the autocratic, but blessedly benevolent autocrat in that situation. Without a doubt, she's the leader. There wouldn't be an uprising or a dispute against her. But, you know, it's interesting in some animal species, there there is some pushback, right? We see this a lot with chimp groups and they're, they're infighting and fighting other groups of chimps. I mean, there are so many examples of even chimps killing gorillas, which are much bigger than them in, you know, to resolve, let's say, a territorial conflict or, you know, they're in their way or they don't like that other group. So they're fighting over resources. So not all species always get together. Sometimes there is some pushback and sometimes there is fighting within that species. I mean, hey, look at us humans right now. Oh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
all right, so why, you know, why do these animal groups, why do certain species experience some of this pushback? A lot of it is resource. So in, in periods of uh, drought or resource restriction, there'll be competition because everybody wants to survive. Um, and so at, the, at a waterhole in the drought, you'll, you might see some sort of shoving and pushing to try and sort of get in rather than waiting your turn. Um, but again, it, without trying to be too cliche about it, it is a little cliched. Um, the, the males will lead with testosterone and it's competition. They're the leader because they out, out competed all the contestants, um, all their challenges. They're, they were stronger, bigger, faster, more spiky, whatever it is. Um, so it's a competition based system. Um, and when you have these sort of exceptions to the rules, you're not working with competition, you're working with cooperation. It's just a different way of, of valuing um, keeping a group together. Um, it's done, sort of, as I said, this sort of benevolent effect rather than control. All right. So before we move on to exploring like the qualities of great leaders, I'd really like to look at like how leaders aren't always what we think they should be like just mm -hmm. because you're the biggest baddest out there doesn't mean you're the the leader you know mm -hmm. like where does mental kind of play into that i mean a good example like in the animal kingdom are wolves right wolves actually have very similar dynamics as human beings where you know you may have the alpha and sometimes you know you have a beta who's stronger than the alpha and then you know but the beta is you know relying on the alpha you know so wolves are very you know dynamic in there i mean what's really cool is they're one of those species like even as their elderly gets old they'll make sure they're fed right they don't just leave them to to chance like some other you know animal species wolves actually have a very strong sense of family and pack mentality is probably why most people you know like dogs right mm -hmm. we're very similar even some of the chemical balance is like you stare into a dog's eyes. It's the same thing as humans staring into each other's eyes that happens in your brain. So we're very similar and there's probably a lot we can really learn from wolf species. Everybody in a social network, in a social group, knows what the expectations are in that group. They know what their role is and they know if everybody does their part, then everybody wins. So there's a sort of a selfish aspect to it. Then in some societies, you have the familiar ties. So you're, you're blood related, you are kin, they're your parents, for example, or, or whatever. And so there is this respect of elders, respect of wisdom, respect of their just leadership skills um, that say, well, yeah, I, I might be good at these things, but I'm not as good as the leader at all the things. So I'm not going to challenge. Um, and that changes over time, you know, especially as the adolescents grow up, there's a lot of, you know, sort of, I mean, play fighting was in, was sort of part of the, the learning process to train them to become leaders down the line. And some will become leaders and obviously most of them won't, but there's a, there's room in the societies for that training to take place, even from a young age, so that the next generation will be able to lead effectively um the the thing with wolves though that um can often be misunderstood is that the wolf structure which obviously correlates to our domestic dogs as well um is not actually a single alpha led society it is a dominant pair it's a mr and mrs wolf leadership and their leadership is completely joint um, you cannot have a you cannot have a successful wolf pack with one alpha leader. You have to have an alpha male and an alpha female. Partly because the only two wolves that breed in a pack are the alpha male and the alpha female. They are the parents of the group. Um, they want to keep their the genetics clean, so they, they and and they have long term relationships with each other. It's one of the very few examples as well where there is parental care in a mammalian society. Um, sorry, paternal care in a mammalian society as opposed to just the mother looking after the offspring. So the father is very heavily involved in that. And so the division of labor of wolf pack leadership is split 50-50 between the alpha male and alpha female. So they become the dominant pair and the alpha terminology has kind of been put by the wayside um, because it has too many of these connotations with the, the single alpha male dominant king, you know, thing. And it doesn't stop working like that at all. So there is a beta who is, um, um, usually the the tough guy um, who is 
frequently a brother of one or other of the dominants. Um, so there's very close familial ties there. And the alpha's job in that society, the alpha pair job in that society is to look after the pack and the beta will be like the bodyguard and will step to the front. And so the beta is actually often bigger than the alpha, um, but he needs to have those muscles and that sort of aggressive front foot attack thing in order to deal with conflict from the outside. Whereas the dominant pair are leading from within and their, their division of labor is Typically, the male will look after the provision, finding the food or co uh, coordinating the hunt, and the, the female's job is the education of the pups, the care of the pups, and the co social cohesion of the family. You know, we, we talked about earlier working together and listening and how those are really important characteristics of great leaders. Um, mm -hmm. But I think one of the other really important characteristics, and you can correct me if you think there's something more important, but I mean, I think protecting your people or your pack or whatever that is, right? Protecting your, your people. Um, right. I think that's really important. No, abs absolutely. Because I think no one wants to stand next to a leader or, or behind a leader or whatever the case is, right? They want to support someone who's not going to support them. And, you know, part of that, if you look at, if you look at history of animals, you look at history of humans, you know, they gathered around, you know, people who could give them some protection, you know, otherwise we'd be solitary animals, right? We wouldn't mm -hmm. live in communities or we wouldn't live in, we'd be more solitary. So yeah, someone, you know, people want people who are going to, you know, look out for it for them and, and look out for their interest. You know, however you brand that protection, right? right? Whether it's physical right. protection or it's protection of your assets or it's protection right. of your values, you know, they right. want someone who's going to stand up for those things for them. And I think of a fictional leader, um, you know, and we were talking kind of about our our favorite fictional and non-fictional leaders. And and one of the fictional characters that, that pops out to me is a detective or sergeant or whatever he is, Hank Foyt on uh, Chicago PD. And, you know, he's not your, as conventional a leader, he doesn't always follow the rule book, right? But um, he does have his people in his squad and he, he will go out there and he will get in trouble for them. You know, mm -hmm. he likes to tell them, you tell me the truth and I'll lie for you. You know, you guys come first and you're like my babies, right? And like, mm -hmm. and, you know, in yeah. a nice way, right? Like you're, mm -hmm. you're mine. I take care of you. You're, you're in this group. Mm -hmm. Like Robert De Niro in the circle of trust, right? From Meet right. the Parents. <laughs> like, right. You're in that group and that's my job now is to protect mm -hmm. you. I'm the leader. That's my job. It falls on me. And the same actually goes for geese. In fact, I was looking at an example um, of geese, which is a, a, the one bird example I kind of have, you know, and we know the geese fly in formation when they're migrating. They're in this V shape with one leader goose and the others back on these, these very specific angles flying together. Now you will hear them long before you see them because they're all squawking at each other. And basically that all the ones that are behind the, the V, the captain, um, are shouting encouragement saying, yeah, go on, you're awesome. Keep flying. Yes, this is amazing. You know, and so so they're like the cheer squad of the leader goose. But, you know, as soon as the leader goose gets tired, they'll just slow down, fly around to the back, and one of the front other two will take their place. And so there's this swapping situation that says, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take myself out of the running now, and the next guy can come in and, and do it and take over that leadership role for a period of time time. Now, if a goose actually gets really super tired and was out of formation by themselves, two others will immediately go with them. And so those three will all fly off to, to wherever, to the ground together. So the, the tired goose has two bodyguards, if you like, two cheer, cheer squads, two nurturers, whatever you want, who will stay with them, look after them, wait until they've got their strength back up, and then they'll fly in a little V together, a little mini V of three, um, and until they catch up with the, the main group. So no one's left behind. There's this incredible sense of if you're in our society, you are valued, you belong, you count, you've got a role, um, everyone's important. And it, just because the leader is the leader doesn't mean that they're more important than the others. And I think sometimes in human societies, we tend to say the leader is the leader and also the most important. And we have a different viewpoint of, of how we then um, feel about being led when we class ourselves lower. 
Um, and then you've got the problems of, well, do I feel like I'm controlled? Do I feel like they've got their best interests? Are they going to listen to me? If, they, if you know, And sometimes you run into problems and sometimes you don't because you've got the really benevolent, kind, you know, the classic King Arthur or, you know, Paragon leader or something. But um, in animal societies, that's, that's a given. You just don't have that exploitation. So, you know, one of the parts about being a good leader is basically knowing when you make mistakes and fixing those mistakes, right? right? Having some humility. And basically, you know, with that, you're able to sort of show you're a human being, you know, because I think, you know, in society, we really don't like people who have this, this, uh, I don't, how do I want to say it? Like this, this image where they're not human, right? They're mm -hmm. nothing, nothing affects them. Nothing, you know, they can't be touched. Like there's some magical unicorn, you know, political person, you know, people want to see their real human beings. Now, do we want our leaders to make mistakes? No. Do we accept that our leaders do sometimes make mistakes? Yes, we, we do because we know as human beings, we're going to make mistakes. And I think being, you know, humble enough to sort of own up to your mistakes correct them and like readdress what's going on and be honest about it mm -hmm. with the people following you is a huge characteristic for leaders. I just want to bring up one example. Um, last week I was at the doctor and the, the doctor had told the nurses, um, it's a pretty big office. He told the nurses, don't take anybody's vitals if they're sick. Cause in our COVID times, he didn't want any, he didn't want the nurse to come, to come, in our COVID times, he didn't want the nurses to come close. So, um, you know, he came into the room and he said, how come your vitals aren't taken? And he looked at all the paperwork and he said, he called the front desk and he said, why is it that I've gone into three rooms and nobody's vitals are taken? Mm -hmm. And then he hung up the phone and he looked at me and he said, I told them not to take anyone's vitals if they were sick. Damn it. And he picked up the phone and he called the front desk again. And he said, I'm sorry, guys, I effed up. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. You did right. Yeah. You know, and it's just something as simple as that. Mm -hmm. It shows that like, okay, you're human. You, yes, you're the boss. You run this office, but you made a mistake and now you're not, you know, you can go out and say that. And, and I think too, one of the things that really comes across to the person hearing the message is you actually care about them. You care about their feelings. You care that, you know, you were upset that you made, you know, that you, they, no one took the vitals, but then you realized it was your fault mm -hmm. and you took your time now to turn around and say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I care about you. Cause that's really what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You're saying, I care enough about you to admit that I was wrong. Do you know? And, and, you know, I'm sorry. And that's important to people, you know? And I think when leaders do that, they change the relationship between them and that other person. Actually, any relationship, right? It's not even like leaders. You know, if you have the humility to say, I'm sorry, I messed up, people are much more, much more willing to, you know, forgive you or, or work with you than if you start shuffling the blame away right. on something else. I think one of the most important things for a leader to have is humility. It's people often will place a leader on a pedestal and think that they are perfect and that they're they don't make mistakes. And that is not true. They they do make mistakes. And I think because of they're in positions of power often, they're they're judged more so than others. And one of the things I've learned as a historian and and writing this book that I just, I wrote about President Obama, is he made a lot of mistakes, but, and a lot of bad mistakes, but he owned up to them and admitted I was wrong. And and I think generally speaking, people understand that, that, that it once they get over the initial shock that somebody that they admire so much is human and they welcome the ability for people to say, look, I was wrong, please forgive me. Important. So humility is super important. Huge. Okay. So listening, communication, cooperation, humility. What about charisma? I mean, how important do we think that is? Some of the best presidents the United States has had, from Kennedy to Reagan to Clinton to Obama, they were charismatic. And I think that does play a role. Yeah, I think charismatic leaders, um, I look at it like marketing. You can have a really crappy product. Mm -hmm. But if you have good marketing, um, you can sell a lot. It's almost the same. Do you disagree? I agree. I agree. The problem is, is once you get past the charisma, 
if they're really not saying anything or your product sucks, everyone's going to eventually realize it sucks, right? <laughs> whether it's a leader or whether it's a product, it doesn't matter. Um, so uh, do I think charisma is important? Yes, I do. And and I don't mean like, oh, they're a good looking person charisma. I mean, people like sitting there talking to you. They feel good about it. They feel, you know, and that's really to me what charisma is. It's, it's being able to be captivating enough, but if there's no substance, eventually that is going to hurt you. It will mm -hmm. hurt you. And charismatic people can really get people behind them. I mean, you talk about working toward a vision and a goal. I mean, think about some of the like famous serial killers. They were pretty charismatic, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not that I would say that's a leader, but. <laughs> no, I guess not. But they were charismatic. <laughs> Some of them. <laughs> Charisma has really got a thing. I mean, yeah. all right. So what other skills then do you think are important when you're leading? Uh, I, I I know we said speak. I know we've got Thomas Jefferson doing tweets, but I mean, I think speaking is still pretty important. Yeah. Well, I think that's, you know, I think when we talk about charisma, right? Charisma has different forms. Some people are just very witty and that's what their charisma is. Other people are very intelligent. Other people are just captivating. So yes, if you um, can't relay your message speaking, it, it, that's a tough one, right? If you're not able to relay your message, whether it's writing it or speaking it or you know uh being uh, being social right because social is a big part of it now we we saw so much of that in the last i don't know what eight years probably mm -hmm. 10 years how if you're not have this social presence it, it becomes very complicated for you so let's look at what it was like for thomas jefferson though so he wasn't the greatest speaker but you know he had some things working in his favor and he wasn't that good looking of a guy either, so. The <laughs> well, I suspect if he were alive today, he'd be taking voice lessons <laughs> because you do have to be an effective speaker today. Less so in his day because so much of, uh, uh, of what was said was said in writing, letters back and forth. No telephones then, of course, no radio, no TV. And so the founding fathers communicated with each other in writing and then um, his reports as president to Congress were, were given um, sometimes in person, but sometimes in writing. And, um, but certainly if, if he had to project, he would probably take some speech lessons today. But back then, he didn't really need to do that. Okay, but we, we did have some great historical leaders that were very, very good speakers, right? Because that was one of the, the big things with President Obama and even President Reagan. You don't really have to like either one of them to understand that they that they are good speakers. They can get people on their side very, very easily. So, I mean, we sort of mentioned this, but, you know, media has evolved so greatly in the last, you know, 15 years, right? that it's changed sort of the landscape. So it's not even just like the written, like if you think about like Abraham Lincoln, great order, but it was relayed on other people telling what he said, mm -hmm. right? Or reading what he said, mm -hmm. or maybe even like getting it from a newspaper, right? right. You, you didn't actually see it or hear it yourself. Then it evolved into this radio and TV and we could see and hear the person. And now it's very different because from the social spirit, you do have you have video, you have chunks of video, which can be manipulated in so many different ways. You also have the written word, you have images. There are so many things that play into how that person's presented and how their message is presented. It really becomes quite complex. Whereas for Thomas Jefferson, you know, it was written word, right? Most of it was written word. So it was very different back then. And you know what? I just thought of something. You know, social media actually gives people a, a place to be leaders. Think about uh, gaining these large followings, right? And let's think about what a leader is again. Let's go back to that definition. You know, kind of having a vision, getting people to rally behind you, believe in that vision, you know, kind of join you on that mission. And really, a lot of these social influencers, the real genuine ones, are, are doing that. That's what they're doing. They are gathering this following. And if they had some sort of goal, I think they'd have a pretty mm -hmm. good following. Absolutely. I do think that with the invention of, of the media, 
you had to certain criteria and characteristics had to evolve. You had to be more than just decent looking. You had to, you had to be able to put two or three sentences together in a, in a statement for the newspaper. And then eventually, then you had to, when something happened. So for example, with Roosevelt, when he had to address the nation with regard to what, when the United States entered World War II, he had the calmly in front of all of the country go on the radio and tell people what was going on, why we were entering the war and what what to expect. And so I think he needed more skills than say, for example, uh, say Abraham Lincoln, who had a similar, you know, he had to lead the country during a war as well. Uh, so I think there, there, that kind of evolves. So I think another um, really important characteristic is this ability to bring people together. And mm -hmm. yes, there are plenty of leaders who are more divisive than others, but I think when you can really bring groups together, especially ones that don't always see eye to eye, I mean, that is a really great leader. And and I think I'd like to bring up George Bush um, after 9-11. George like, Bush Jr. Yes, sorry, I'm sorry, yes, Jr. That's right, after 9-11 and how he brought people together mm -hmm. in America. President Bush, right after 9-11, when he was down at ground zero behind with, with the megaphone, telling the, you know, he put his arm around the firefighters and just said, look, we, we hear you. We, we understand where, where you're coming from. We will make sure the, the people pay. So I wanted to bring up another leader who I think was really able to bring people together, mm -hmm. okay, and rally against or for something. And I know we have to separate out William Wallace and Braveheart and the real William <laughs> Wallace. I will say my yes. favorite is William Wallace and Braveheart, but uh -huh. we will go with the real William Wallace. But I the real William Wallace. Just one chance to come back here and tell our enemies that they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. The premise is the same, right? I mean, he was well, fighting. Well, yeah, the there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's part of it. Uh, you know, I think, you know, Braveheart, they, they dumb it down. Like he was actually, you know, William Wallace was actually born a nobleman, right? He was born to a lesser noble family. I know you and I have had this discussion. You know, Mel Gibson's what, probably like five ten. The real William mm -hmm. Wallace was like six five or six seven which you know when you're in battle that uh you know that helps and you know there his sword is uh in a museum in scotland i think his sword is five foot four inches tall which is pretty crazy so i i mean but think about it he mm -hmm. two different time frame you know totally different you know scenarios right you've got george bush and 9 11 you got william wallace fighting right. for freedom from you know the the Brits, is that what they called them back then too? The English? Um, the English, yeah. I don't know if they called but, them the Brits, but that was yeah. just in America. <laughs> the Brits, the British are coming. Um, but I, I think it's the qualities that are the same, right? Like there's this, there's this um ability to get people to rally behind you. And and then I think there's also this this characteristic that they're fearless in their ideals and and you know someone we were talking to brought up this concept like fearless in your ideals and 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 i think a lot of these leaders are i mean you look at william wallace you look at thomas jefferson right and a lot of those early um you know adapters of the right. constitution i mean they were really they were really fearless in their mm -hmm. ideals mm -hmm. well i think i mean you know if you know, I mean, Thomas Jefferson is a little bit different than William Wallace. William mm -hmm. Wallace, they were they were fighting for their land and their lives, and you know, and their way of life. You know, and I think it was, you know, is very is very different. Which I think, which you know, in that case, right, where William Wallace, if we're just talking about William Wallace right now, mm -hmm. you know, like he was putting his life out on the line. He was in battles, you know, mm -hmm. and I think being the physical presence he had, right, was very important as a leader too, not just, you know, and and here's the thing, don't get me wrong, like he led troops, like he had, you know, brilliant strategies in some of the, some of the fights that were going on. So, but his physical prowess, you know, you're fighting alongside shoulder to shoulder with someone and this dude is, you know, six, five with a five foot long sword that's cleaving people in half. You're going to, you're going to follow him. You're going to follow his lead into battle, right? You know, and he was trained as a young child to my understanding. I think fight. you brought up a good point, and I know we're going to talk more about being fearless in your ideals, but just physical stature. I mean, mm -hmm. how much does that play a role? We didn't, we didn't really cover this at all, but 
I mean, think about a person who is decrepit and, uh, you know, maybe doesn't have their wits about them or something like that. And uh, is that the person that you want to lead you or is it the person who can stand up like William Wallace, right? Like, is that what you want to lead you? Well, I, I mean, there's, that's body language, right? right. I mean, because if you if you look at it, I think the shortest president president was only like five four something like that, or five three, Who and the tallest it? one. I, I don't remember. I remember looking this up, like because I was like, how tall is? I think it was Trump. So well, but, Abraham Lincoln was pretty tall. I think the tallest president was Trump. I mean, we could find out. All right, we'll find out. But but to your point, it doesn't really matter. I guess the height, I guess my point is the height doesn't necessarily matter. It's how you present yourself that matters, right? right? I think it becomes part of how you're presenting yourself out there. Like to your point, how you're standing up. Do you do you have confidence when people look at you? You know, do you look confident? Not just the the fact that if you're confident in your words, but are you confident in your your demeanor? Right. Now, I mean, but let's let's just go back to being fearless in in your ideals, and and I'd like to just dive into a little bit of Thomas Jefferson because I think I think there's something here that we're gonna we're gonna dive into, which is freedom. So I think I'm sensing a common theme here, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, but I think uh, these leaders, freedom is pretty important, right? I mean, I think a good leader mm-hmm. really understands freedom. Mm-hmm. For Jefferson, that was a driving force. Uh, as much as any of the other founding fathers. He he was all about freedom. And of course, if you read the Declaration of Independence, I think he would want us to reread that if we've ever read it in the first place. Um, It's a very noble document. But we remember that in the uh, 1780s, he was America's ambassador to France. And he witnessed the uh, corruption in Europe, France, and most of the other countries of um, nobility being in charge and uh, an unholy alliance with the established religion, with Rome. And uh, I think he was, I know that he was appalled by what he saw in Europe. And he did not want that for America. He wanted Americans to be free, to be free to, um, to worship in the way they wished, and also to be self-governing. And um, that was the basis of the Democratic Republic that was formed, was to give power to the people and to have checks and balances so that those in power would be much less able to abuse their power. And he'd seen great abuse in Europe of power. And so I think that's the difference between leaders who want free societies and those who are more like dictators, right? I mean, mm-hmm. just because they're leaders, yes, they are leaders. They have qualities of, of leadership, but mm-hmm. does that make them a good leader? No. Let's look at like tyrants and things. They don't really mm-hmm. understand freedom for right. all, right? Right. And they don't even want you to have freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, they want if you, you know, and and I think it's really, you know, it's it's about free will, right? So it's 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 not even about freedom. Like we talk about freedom, but it's really about free will. You know, and I think that's some of the biggest things. Like if you think about what the United States was founded on, it is about it is about free will, being able to somewhat do what you want to do, right? You know, you can't do, you know, everything, but it is about freedom of choice, freedom of will, and you being able to make decisions for yourself. And I think when, you know, um, you know, governments or, or leaders are open to that, what happens is they they understand better the need for people, you know, where I think where they just, it's when they're dictating, it's just about the need they see, not the need for the people in a whole. So freedom becomes really important. So one other thing we learned about Thomas Jefferson was um, that he had a pretty, uh, like mentorship was really important mm-hmm. in, in his life and, and what raised him, right? And I think that we often overlook uh, the amazing quality of a great leader being mentorship. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, you know, mentorship should always be a big thing because you're basically now, you know, helping the next the next generation or the next group of people who are going to take over this. And I think, you know, even if they have different beliefs and different goals than you, you know, it is your job to to mentor them. And I think really what happens is when you don't have that mentorship going on, you know, you're not really building the next great leaders because like with anything, you know, everyone things are 
lost and discovered all the time, like pieces of knowledge, pieces of philosophy, pieces of science. They're just lost and discovered over and over and over again. Right. And what happens is, you know, I think it was Socrates who said, you know, you, and I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, you need to build on what others have learned, right? You can't just, you know, go. So that's part of mentorship. It's actually being able to give someone the tools and the knowledge to go further than you were able to go with whether it's an ideal or an idea or how you see things or, you know, because here's the thing, like the only thing that we are limited in, in life is time, right? So what's happening is your sometimes your goals or your visions are much bigger than your life expectancy. Well, someone said behind every great person is usually a great mentor. And that wow. brings me to someone I like as a leader. And I'm going to talk about, you know, it's interesting because if you look at like Elon Musk, right? They're transformative leaders. They're transformational leaders. So it's a totally different type of leadership where you get, you know, it's about transforming and getting people to see a bigger vision than mm -hmm. what exists. And it, those leaders are really interesting to me because those are the ones that actually change the world. So if you look at people like just modern times, you know, you have like, you know, and some people don't like these people, like, but Jeff Bezos. He, he changed the way people actually see the world, the way people actually shop, regardless of whether you hate him and you think he you know, doesn't pay people fairly or whatever political beliefs you have about him or, I, you know, I don't really care. That's not, I don't, I don't know anything about that stuff. But if you look at how he transformed his vision and how he transformed the world, and Elon Musk is doing the same thing. So leaders like that, transformational leaders are actually really important also. I agree. And it's no different than Thomas Jefferson, you know, and, and the, those founding fathers, they changed the way governments, the government mm -hmm. work. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, people always joke around about democracy was like a giant experiment, mm. you know, and, and it was, you know, but it was a vision they had. It was a transformation they saw that needed to change for, you know, humanity. There's one other thing that I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a woman, right? Yes. I'm a bossy woman. I'm a controlling woman. Um, and, and I think. Are you a tyrant, think, Nicolette? Is that I'm your... a tyrant. <laughs> yeah, ask the people, ask the, ask the men in my house. They'll tell you. Um, but I'd say, I'd say there's, there's something to be said about women leaders. Um, I, so here's the thing. I'm, I'm just going to full disclosure. I don't believe that men and women should be, I don't think women should be treated any differently because they're women. Um, you know, I'm anti-national women's day and all this stuff, because you know what, if you want to be equal, just be equal. You don't right. deserve really a celebration. That's just my opinion. You know, I don't want to be treated any different because I'm a woman. I don't want to be treated special because mm -hmm. I'm a woman. But I think there are some women who are in leadership positions who think that they need to now kind of be rougher and tougher and colder because of all these preconceived notions about how soft a woman can be. I think because society expects women to be more emotional, they tend to side on the error of caution and show less emotion because they don't want to be considered as irrational. And I know that that is definitely true with, with Angela Merkel. The, the media loved to, they referred to her as poker face because she showed very, very little emotion one way or the other. And one of the interesting things that I talk about in the book that I wrote about her relationship with Obama was that Obama actually brought out the human side to her because there were times when she and Obama were together, they were they had visited a former concentration camp and she cried. She cried when she said goodbye to Obama for the final time. And then there were other times where they were before groups of people, before journalists, before citizens. And, and she laughed and she giggled and she acted like a a person and not just a world leader. And I think that because there's so much expectation that women are going to be so emotional that there, there's restraint and you don't see a human and, and often to the point where women take it to the extreme and they're considered like Hillary Clinton faced this all the time. People didn't think she was likable because she was so, she tried so hard to be um, neutral. And, and I think that's one challenge that women have, to, women face more than men do. Uh, well, I mean, it's interesting. I, I think that depends on the personality of the person. I mean, you know me, I see people for what they are, not necessarily their sex. I mean, you've known me long enough for, mm -hmm. you know, their sex or anything else. Right. 
So, I mean, I think that's, that's a personality. Like, for instance, here's what I would think. If a woman came in as whatever, the, you know, running some big company and she was extra hard, harder than she normally was in her life, or maybe as like a vice president or something of that company. Mm -hmm. And over since she became whatever the CEO and now she becomes rougher. I would actually question if she had imposter syndrome. I'll be honest with you, because is she just looking at how other people did it and mimicking that? Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, and that's anyone. I mean, that could be a guy or a woman. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. I would question if they're really just mimicking something they, they experienced versus, you know, actually going, okay, I'm going to lead this company the way I see fit to lead this company. And maybe that's how they see it. They just got power and now they're all of a sudden like a, you know, I don't know, a tyrant. My point is, I think if people harden because of that, they're just not being true to themselves unless they were mm -hmm. always like that. And just the other part before that was a, you know, like a, a falsity or whatever. I think it actually diminishes your effectiveness as a woman leader when you go to that extreme. And and I'm going to use the example. There's, um, who is the, the woman who was like breastfeeding her baby, who is like some leader of, I don't know if it was Denmark or Finland or one of those countries, but she, you know, she's a human, she's a mother, she's a woman, right. but she's, she leads a country. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think seeing her as a human, it, it, why does she have to be mean just because she's well, a woman, you know? I mean, right, right. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I, I agree. Like, why? Right. Well, it sort of, it's, it sort of harks back, and I know we're talking about women here, but it sort of harks back to what we were talking about earlier, where people want to see you as a human being. They don't want to see you as this fake right. leader thing like, oh, you know, if you're a woman and you have a child and you're breastfeeding, yeah, okay, you're breastfeeding, right? That's part of your life. Mm -hmm. Like, why do you need to even like hide that? Like, that's what's the crazy part about that. Like, you should be able to go and be like, yeah, I got to take a break because I'm going to go breastfeed my child or whatever I'm taking care of. Like, that's just part of being a good person. <laughs> so let's be honest. Like, so, mm -hmm. and here's the thing. Wouldn't you want a person as a leader? Like for me, I want a person as a leader who is actually like, okay, you know what? my kids are, my kids are more important than like this situation right now. Cause I got to take care of this, mm -hmm. you know? And I got that you may be the leader of the free world or whatever, but yeah, you, you have children and they, they have living Need to eat. You know, lives, <laughs> well, like, well, yeah, but they have lives too. And they have needs. Right. And don't get me wrong. You know, I understand there's a lot of pressure being like, whatever, you know, a, a global leader, but here's the thing too, you know, what do we talk about mentorship, right? You're, you're taking care of those children. You're also now showing Country. your, your, everyone that follows you mm -hmm. that they should be a human too, and they should do good things. Right. So it's not, you know, I, I, those leaders that have that false appearance, right? What does that show you? Like, it's okay. Like if you like, if your guilty pleasure is eating a Big Mac, go eat a Big Mac. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like who cares if people see it? <laughs> you know, like it's, that's, a, that's how you are. Mm -hmm. I'd rather know how you are than, go, okay, this guy's, you know, full of crap. Right. You know what I mean? Exactly. Or like there's it's a, more genuine. Like, right. Like, I'd rather be like, okay, you know. And so, I think uh, a lot of women, like, I mean, we see this with, uh, what's her name uh, in, in Germany? Uh, Angela Merkel, that's her name, mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, and so. and Hillary Clinton, even. I mean, we see this very hardened appearance on these leaders. Well, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, I, think it, I don't yeah. think they need to be that way. I, I think it kind of... They, I think they think they need to be that way. Yeah, I, I agree. If you have that hard demeanor, right, like that, like that false demeanor, like it's going to be hard for me to go, I could follow this person. Yeah, it really would. I mean, what's your thoughts on it? You you think it's easy to follow people like that have that hard demeanor like that? Or false demeanor, I should say? No, no, not at all. No. Don't get me wrong. Are there times and place that you probably need that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You look at like people like Winston Churchill, hard mm -hmm. demeanor, right? I mean, hard demeanor was leading his country through a war. So I want to wrap up with one last thing. I've already mentioned one of my favorite fictional characters, and I know you have a favorite fictional character uh, in I, mind, a good fictional leader, I should say. Um, and I was wondering if you would share with us who your favorite fictional leader is. I don't know if he's my favorite fictional leader, but one of the people I really like as a fictional character, and I know everyone laughs because they think of the movie, not so much the comic book character, right, is... Um, is it were actually really wasn't even a comic book character. He was a story character is Conan the Barbarian, you know, and people can be like, Oh, Conan the Barbarian, he's chopping people's heads <laughs> off, it was, you know, but the thing I think that was really interesting about Conan, right? He was, you know, because we started off with who made you King, 
Mm -hmm. right? Conan was always believed he was destined to be king of his kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. And he was always on this journey to be king of his kingdom. And what's interesting about Conan is sometimes he was a thief, sometimes he was a king, sometimes he was doing bad stuff, sometimes he was doing good stuff. And he was always focused on his mission, right? To to find his kingdom. And no matter who crossed his journey, right? Who, no matter who was with him or against him, he was very loyal to those with him and he took care of those with him and he brought them along their journey. And sometimes his journey wasn't necessarily about his journey. His journey was about the people that were journeying with him, right? And helping them through their, their trials. Now you're talking about, you know, a fictional character, you know, that was in like Pulp Fiction books. Um, but the reality is, I think that's one of the the thing that I point out here is the ability of a leader to be multiple things, not just be, you know, hard, fast, like sometimes, yeah, sometimes you are a thief and sometimes you are a king, you know, and being able to be flexible in what's happening in leadership, because certain situations are going to call for different types of a person, right, or different parts of your personality to come through in order to make that situation resolve. I agree. I like that full circle. We brought it full circle to who made you king. Right. So Conan the Barbarian. And you know what's Conan weird? the why Barbarian. Does, why does Conan the Barbarian always randomly show up in like uh <laughs> yeah, 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 he does. So I, I think we should we should leave we should leave you with this. Um you know take something from every leader and and focus on the qualities that they have that you can then incorporate into your own life because whether you're leading um you know the local library reading group mm -hmm. or you're leading a country or you're leading a team of employees you know or, or you're leading your children right, right? That's like your the family most powerful and important leadership right. position there is right absolutely and talk about mentorship i mean that's mm -hmm. really where the mentorship needs to take place yeah but yes. um what, no matter what you're doing you know it's important to just remember that you can improve and um you know let's look to some of the greatest leaders to see what we can draw on them especially the animals and i think the other thing that's really important to remember is as times change and situations change you need to pull different parts of your leadership skills right don't be like a one-dimensional leader you know in your life or whatever you got to be you got to have multiple facets in there in order to help yourself help others help whatever the cause is accomplish great things